From Burlingame, California, it's theCUBE. Covering Sumo Logic Illuminate 2019. Brought to you by Sumo Logic. Hey, welcome back everybody. Jeff Frick here with theCUBE. We're at the Hyatt Regency San Francisco Airport at Sumo Logic Illuminate 2019. We were here last year for our first time. It's the third year of the show. It's probably 800, 900 people, around 1,000. Packed house, just had to uh, finish the keynote and we're really excited to have our first guest of the day who's been here since the very beginning. He's Bruno Kurtik, the founding VP of product and strategy for Sumo Logic. Bruno, great to see you. Likewise, thank you. So I was doing a little homework and uh, you were actually on theCUBE, AWS reInvent, I think 2013. Wow, how far has the cloud journey progressed since yeah. that first, I think it was our first year at reInvent as yeah. well. And that's the second year of reInvent. Right. Yeah. So, what, a, what an adventure, you guys made a good bet uh, six years ago, seems to be paying off pretty well. It really has been. Um, we kind of sniffed out that the cloud is going to be a real thing, um, put all of our bets into it, and have been executing ever since, and, and I think we were right. I think it is no longer a question, is this cloud thing going to be real? Our enterprise is going to adopt it. It's just how quickly and how much. Right, right. But we've seen kind of this continual evolution, right? It was this, this, this jump into public cloud. Everybody jumped in with both mm -hmm. feet, and now they're pulling yeah. back a little bit. But now we're really seeing this growth of the hybrid cloud. Big announcement here with Anthos and, yeah. and Google Cloud Platform. And, and, and containers, and you know, the rise of Docker, and the rise of Kubernetes. So, I don't know, as you look at kind of the evolution, a lot of positive things kind of being added to the ecosystem that have helped you guys in your core mission. That's right, and look, you know, five years ago, which is such a short time, but yet in sort of the, the speed of the technology adoption and change, you know, it's in, it's in millennia. Uh, what's happened over the last few years is Technology stacks have changed dramatically. We've gone from, okay, we can host some VMs in the cloud and put some databases in the cloud to we're now building microservices architecture, leveraging new technologies like Kubernetes, like serverless technologies and all this stuff. And you know, some, one of the uh, uh, fastest growing technologies that's being adopted by Sumo Logic Customer Base, actually the fastest, is Kubernetes. And um, also the fastest customer segment, growing customer segment in Sumo Logic, is multi-cloud customers. Basically, that sort of um, desire by enterprise to build choice into their offerings, being able to have leverage over the providers, is really coming to fruition right now. Right, but the multi-cloud almost it makes a lot of sense, right? Because we hear over and over, you want to put your workload in the environment that's most appropriate for the workload. You know, it kind of exactly. it kind of flipped the bid. It was no longer here's your infrastructure. What mm -hmm. kind of apps can you build on it now? Here's my app. Where should it run? Mm -hmm. And that may be on prem. It may be in a public cloud. It may that's be right. in a data center. Yep. So it, it's kind of logical that we've come into this this hybrid cloud world. That said, now you've got a whole another layer of complexity that that's, right. that's been added on, and that's really been a big part of the rise of Kubernetes. That's right. And uh, so as you're adopting services that are not equal, right? You have to create a layer that insulates you from those services. Uh, if you look at, in, in our uh, continuous intelligence report that we just announced today, you will also see that how customers and enterprises are adopting cloud services is they're essentially adopting the basic and core compute, storage, network, and database services. And the, there's a long, long tail of services that are very infrequently adopted. And that is because enterprises are looking for a way to not get too locked in to, into any one service provider. Kubernetes give them that, gives them that layer of insulation with Anthos and other technologies like that. You are now able to seamlessly manage all of those workloads, whether they're on your on-premise, in AWS, in GCP, in Azure, or anywhere else. Right. So there's, there's so much we can unpack here. One of the things I want to touch on, which you talked about six years ago, but it's even more, uh, I think, appropriate today, is kind of this um, scale, this exponential growth of data, yeah. um, and this exponential s scale of complexity. Mm -hmm. and, and we as people, and it's been written about by a lot of, of, of smarter people than I, we have a real hard time as humans with exponential growth. We yep. we, everything's linear to us. So as you look at this exponential growth, and now we're trying to get insights now, we've got IoT and this machine to machine data, yep. which is a whole nother multiple orders yep. of magnitude. You can't work in that world with a single pane of glass with somebody looking at a dashboard that's trying to find a yellow light that's starting to, soon to go red. If you don't have analytics, yeah. you're hosed. That's right. This is no longer a world of ding dong lights, right? You can't just like say, okay, red, green, yellow. You, the, 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 as sort of companies go digital, right, which is driving this growth in data, 
you know, ultimately that data is governed by Moore's law. Moore's law says machines are going to be able to do twice as much every 18 to 24 months. Well, that, guess what? They're going to tell you what they're doing twice as much every 18 to 24 months, and that is an exponential growth rate, right? The challenge with that is budgets don't grow at that rate either, right? So budgets are not exponentially growing, so how do you cope with the onslaught of this data? And if you're running a digital service, right? If you're serving your customers digitally, generating revenue through digital means, which is just about every industry at, at this point in time, you must get that data, because if you don't get that data, you can't run your business. This data is useful not just in operations and security, it's useful for, for general business, it's useful in marketing, in product management, in sales, and the complexity and the analytics required to actually make sense of that data and serve it to the right constituency in the business is really hard. And that has been what have, we have been trying to solve including this economics of machine data, and Ramin talked about it today in the keynote, is we're trying to, to bend the cost curve of Moore's law, yet deliver the analytics that the enterprise can leverage to really not just operate an application, but run their business. Right, so let's talk about this concept of observability. You've yeah. written some blogs about it. Yeah. You know, when you talk to people about observability, what should they be thinking about? How are you defining it? Why is it important? Yeah. It's a great question. So observability right now is being defined as a technique. Right, the, the simplest way to think about it is people think of observability, I need to have these three data sets and I have observability, right? And then you have to ask yourself a question. First of all, what is observability? And why does it matter, right? Um, I think there's a, a big misconception in the market and how people adopt this is that they, they think observability is the end, but it isn't. Observability is the means of achieving a goal. And what we like to talk about is what is the goal of observ observ observability. Right now, observability is talked about strictly in the DevOps space, right? Basically, how am I going to get uh, observability into an application and it's maybe runtime, how it's running, whether it's up and, and performant. The challenge with that is that is a pigeon, pigeonhole view of observability. Observability, if you think about it, we talk about objectives during observability. Observability to, a S to an SRE, could be uptime and performance. Well, guess what? To a different group, like security, observability is not getting breached, understanding your compliance posture, making sure that you are compliant with, with regulatory rules and things like that. Uh, observability to a business person, to a product manager who's, who owns a P&L on some product is how are my users uh, using this product? How is my application being adopted? Where are the users uh, having trouble? What are they, in, where is the user experience poor, right? So all of this data is multifaceted and multi-useful. It has multi-uses and observability to us is, is objectives driven. If you don't know what your objective is, observability is just a tool. I love that, that you know, because it, it falls under this thing we talk about often too, which is, you know, there's data, Right, and then there's information in the data. That's right. And then, but that is it useful information, right? Because it has to be applied yeah. to something. That's right. In and of itself, it has no value. Correct. And what you're talking about really is getting the right data to the right person at the right time, That's which, right. which, which kind of stumbles into another area, which is how do you drive innovation in an organization? And, and one of the simple concepts is democratization. If you get more people, more of the data, more of the yeah. tools to manipulate the data, then right. that, that P&L manager is going to make a different decision based on different visibility than right. the security person or the DevOps person. Yeah. So how is, how is that evolving? Where do you see it going? Where was it in the past? And, and yeah. you know, I think you made it interesting, or Ramin made an interesting thing in the keynote where you, know, you guys let your software be available to everyone. And there was a lot yeah. of people talking about giving more people more access to the tools and more of the data yeah. so that they can start to drive yeah. this innovation. I'll give you sort of a, a, an example, sort of one of the, one of the sort of uh, aspects of when we talk about continuous intelligence, what do we mean? Um, so this uh, concept of agile development didn't evolve because people somehow thought, hey, why don't we just try to push code to production all the time, break stuff all the time, what's the, what's the reason why that came about? It did not come about because somehow somebody decided it's a better software development model. It's because companies tried to innovate faster. So they, they wanted to accelerate how they deliver digital products and services to their customers. And what facilitates that delivery cycle is the feedback loop they get out of their data, right? They push code early, they observe the data, 
they understand what it's telling them about how their customers are using their products and services, what products are working, what are not, and they're quickly baking that feedback back into their development cycles, into their business, business cycles, to make better products. Effectively, it evolved as a, as a tool to differentiate and out-innovate the competition, right? right. And that's, to, to a large degree, one of the ways that you deliver the right insight to the right group to improve your business, right? And so, this is applicable across all uh, use cases in all, de all departments uh, around a company, but that's just one example of right. how you think of this continuous innovation, continuous data, continuous analytics, and continuous insights. You don't spend two years doing an MRD, and another two years doing a PRD, and then another right. two years shipping a product. Right. <laughs> you know, and then when you, when you actually ship it, half of the assumptions that you made two years ago are already old and, right, and, and right, wrong, right? right? And so now you got to go, you've wasted half of your development time and you've only released half of the value that you could have otherwise, right? Right, right. And your assumptions are, are not going to be correct, right? You just right. don't know, right? Until That's you get right. that stuff and out time, there. And you know, things change world. over time. Like two years ago, Kubernetes was a single digit percentage uh, adoption technology in Sumo's customer base. Now it's a third, right? right? Which means, no, things have changed. Right? If I had made an assumption as of two years ago on Kubernetes, I would have not, we wouldn't have done this announcement. Right, right. But we did it in an iterative mode and we benefit from that continuous information and continuous intelligence that we do on our own data. Right, right. We've had Joe and the, and the boys on lots of times, so that's, yeah. uh, it's a pretty interesting how fast that came and how it really kind of overtook Docker as yeah. a form of the container. Even though Docker, according to the report, is still getting yeah. a ton, a ton yeah. of traction. And it's, it's working in, in conjunction with Kubernetes, right? Kubernetes allows you to manage those containers, right? right? right. And Docker containers are always part of that ecosystem, and so it's, you know, you know, it's like the management layer and the actual container layer. Right? right. So as you look forward, to give you the last word, you know, as we're really kind of getting into this IoT um, yeah. world, and 5G's coming just around the, around the corner, which yeah. is going to have a giant impact on, on industrial IoT and, and this machine-to-machine -machine communications. What are some of your priorities? What are you looking, you know, kind of a little bit down the road um, and, and yeah. keeping an eye on? Interesting question. You know, we used to think about IoT as uh, it's a new domain we should think about IoT and maybe we need to build a solution for it, right? It turns out our biggest customers are IoT customers. And it, the way that I have, at least personally, reframed my thinking about IoT is the following. Computational capacity is ubiquitous now. What used to be a modern application in three, four, five years ago was something that you access through your laptop or through your mobile app and maybe your smartwatch. Now, the computation that you interface with runs in your doorbell, in a, in a, in a light switch, in your light bulbs, in the house. It runs everywhere. It runs in your shoe because when you run, it talks to your phone to tell you how many steps you've taken, all this stuff, right? Essentially, enterprises building applications to serve their customers are simply pushing computation farther and farther into our being, like everywhere there is now IP networks, CPUs, memory, and all of those distributed computers are now running the applications that are serving us in our lives, right? And to me, that's what IoT is. It's just an extension of what the digital services are, and we interface with those, and it so happens that when you push computation farther and farther into our lives, you get more and more computers participating, you get more data, and many of our largest customers are essentially ingesting their full stack of IoT devices to serve their customers. Right, it's a crazy future. Yeah. And uh, you know, it's just kind of this continual uh, atomization too of compute yeah. and store exactly. and, and memory. Well Bruno, hopefully uh, it will not be six years uh, before we see you again. Congrats on the conference and thanks, uh, so thanks for taking a few minutes. Absolutely. All Thank right, you. he's Bruno, I'm Jeff. You're watching theCUBE. We're at Sumologic Illuminate at the Hyatt Regency San Francisco Airport. Thanks for watching, we'll see you next time.